our Steve Cohen, who I like to refer to as Meve Moen. Uh, this story is just massive. Uh, and we bring you now a, uh, the director of a docuseries intended to be a response to the Netflix uh, mega hit, Making a Murderer. Uh, it is now airing this other documentary called Convicting a Murderer on Daily Wire Plus streaming service. The 10 episode documentary, as I said, called Convicting a Murderer is the product of six years of work by that guy in the orange shirt wearing a true blue shirt. We'll explain what that is in a moment. His name is Sean Reck. And like the extremely popular Making a Murder, it looks at the killing of photographer Teresa Hallback, may she rest in peace, and the prosecutions of Stephen Avery and his nephew Brendan Dassey, who are both sitting uh, in prison in Wisconsin. It gives credence uh, to the old adage, adage uh, that there's two sides to every story and possibly even more. Uh, I have to tell you, as a uh, former cable news correspondent and a guy that's been in the news business my whole life, this story is absolutely fascinating because it just goes to show you there's different ways to tell a story with different outcomes. And Stephen Avery's story prompted um, warring factions, literally warring factions on social media, You've got the truthers versus the guilters. We'll talk about that a little bit. But best guest today, first time on the show, and hopefully not the last time, you've got Sean Reck. He directed Convicting a Murderer. He's a uh, documentary director and producer. He's most known for creating films that document wrongful convictions and over-sentencing. Three of his project subjects have been released from prison. He also frequently examines the role of journalism in the justice system, his first film, which I loved, A Murder in the Park, uh, was named to Time Magazine's list of the 15 most fascinating true crime stories ever told. That is A Murder in the Park. He also uh, directed White Boy, and other fantastic documentary, and now Convicting a Murder, which is what we're going to talk about today. And then, of course, welcome back, Anjanette Levy. She's a correspondent and host for the Long Crime Network. She's covered a number of high-profile cases in both state and federal courts throughout her career, including the trials of Stephen Avery, which is what brings her to us today, uh, Brooke Schuyler Richardson, and most recently the trials of Kyle Rittenhouse and former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin. Uh, during the Stephen Avery trial, Anjanette worked uh, as a reporter, a local reporter for WFRV in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Without further ado, I want to get to the guest, but I also want to bring this up and show you a quick trailer of convicting a murder. Here we go. I call from oh, Steve. an inmate at the Calumet County Jail. The man served 18 years in prison until DNA evidence cleared his name. The Two Rivers man was convicted of sexual assault in 1985, but exonerated with DNA evidence in 2003. So this is the infamous Avery Lott. Now, two years later, he again finds himself tied to a police investigation. Accused of murdering Teresa Holbuck on the Avery property. Stephen Avery's 16-year-old nephew admitted his involvement in the rape and murder of Teresa Holbuck. The car is discovered just around the bend. It was just this worldwide phenomenon. I think they framed this guy. I think he intended to crush the vehicle, but ran out of time. Avery thinks the $36 million lawsuit he filed is why he's being targeted in this investigation. 1021 at 24 Main Street. Uh, do we have Stephen Avery custody? Netflix made millions of dollars from making a murderer, but the filmmakers left out very important details. Mountains of evidence that you have not yet seen. The blood vial. The most egregious manipulation from the movie. Interrogation. So that's when he started beating me because I told him that he's sick. Cell phones. And I saw melted plastic parts of a cell phone. Interviews. Her arms were pinned behind her head. They made Stephen Avery look like a victim. You believe your brother's guilty? I don't know if I'm a suspect. I got on high. I'm getting sick and tired of media deception. Evidence piling up. Why would they omit so many different things? Why are you editing my testimony? I am not going to make the same mistake that the filmmakers did. Rearranging the testimony. They delete a portion of it at the end. How could they claim to care about the truth? They all know that Stephen Avery committed this crime. The 
evidence forces me to conclude that you are the most dangerous individual ever to set foot in this courtroom. There you see it. You can watch it on Daily Wire Plus. Um, Sean, welcome to the show. How How is uh, convicting a murderer doing? And by the way, I guarantee at some point I will call convicting, making and making convicting. So I apologize in advance. But how is uh, the documentary doing? <laughs> uh, well, uh, in September, it was the number one uh, factual TV show in the world, according to Rotten Tomatoes. So that's quite a feat, considering it's on a, a pretty small streamer. So uh, we're very proud of that. Uh, that's quite a feat indeed. Um, tell us a little bit. How did the um, again, I'm fascinated uh, because I was a, basically a beat reporter and a producer for 27 years. Um, and every time you put together a story, there's really multiple ways to put it together, but certainly at least two. And you see two totally different sides to a story here. So I want to dive into that. But first, Sean, just tell us, I mean, how did all this come about? Obviously, Making a Murder was a massive uh, hit for Netflix back in 2015. I think I have the statistic somewhere. It was like 29 million views, I want to say, in the first bunch of days. And I'll double check that. Um, but a massive hit. So how did you decide to team up with Candace Owens and Daily Wire uh, to make this? Well, that, that came a little later, um, the Daily Wire partnership. Uh, first of all, I watched um, I watched Making a Murder, and I believed Making a Murder because it's implicit that you're watching facts, even though they're constructed. Um, and I thought uh, it was helping my movie, A Murder in the Park, immensely because when people were done binging, that was the first real crime binge. The jinx, you couldn't, you couldn't binge because it was serialized. So Making a Murderer wanted to wanted it out all at once. That's what their computers were telling them that people wanted. So I watched it. I believed it. And then I read two weeks later, I read an article in the New Yorker written by Catherine Schultz saying, here's everything they left out. And uh, it, it was a lot that they left out. And then I read another story in I think Salon or Slate by Bronwyn Dickey uh, was about the, the emotional manipulation in the filmmaking of Making a Murderer. So I just sort of as a fan uh, was uh, was waiting for the response piece. I said, boy, somebody's going to make a slap back. And, and I was making a lot of money off Making a Murderer because when people were done, I would be on those lists of things that you might want to consider if you, if you have a hankering for more of that type of programming. So it was good for my industry, but but when I found out how deceptive it was, I realized it's bad for my industry and someone's got to set the record straight. So it wasn't until two years later that um, Tom Fossbender and Ken Kratz saw Making a Murderer, and they characterize it as the first time someone had exposed what they call the innocence industry, which is a cabal of journalists, attorneys, and professors who, you know, pop people out of prison and then win big lawsuits. And um, I didn't know I was doing that with Andrew Hale when I made, you know, A Murder in the Park, but they saw it and they said, we trust you with our story. And I, I had to haggle with them a while to have complete independence and control the project and final cut. But uh, when they finally agreed to that, I said, well, I guess I'm making the answer piece. And uh, that's where it started. Um, I got to ask, you know, with the Innocence Project, um, I mean, do you believe that they're also doing good? Um, oh, it's a wonderful you know, organization. Con- okay. The Yeshiva, yeah, just- the Yeshiva Innocence Project, yeah, and Barry Sheck's Innocence Project, but they let anybody who wanted to use their name. Mm-hmm. So the Northwestern University Innocence Project, after I showed Yeshiva a murder in the park in a private screening in their conference room, Northwestern and David Protest's other organization were no longer allowed to use the name The Innocence Project after I showed them what they had done under their name. So no, that's a, it's a it's a wonderful worthy organization that people should support because they they stick to DNA cases. So the, the, you know, mistakes are made. There's a there's an exoneration every day. So clearly there are there are problems out there. Okay, I just, and I'm, I think Stephen yeah. Avery is one of them, to be honest with you. Yeah, and I figured that you would say that. Just wanted to get that on the record. Uh, Anjanette, welcome back to the show. Uh, right out of the gates here, the Society page. Anjanette seems to take heat for this story, which is ridiculous. Love, Anjanette. 
um, and Jeanette, we can kind of, you know, trace our backwards on this, but just out of the gates. I mean, what, what has this experience been like for you? You covered the story, I think for five years or so when you were, uh, in Wisconsin or for a, a chunk of time, uh, what was the experience like? Well, Joel, thanks for having me back as always. Um, very sweet of you to have me. Um, you know, I was, it was my first on-air reporting job. I had worked in Cincinnati for two and a half years or so before that behind the scenes and really uh, learned a lot from a lot of really talented people who were very tough <laughs> news people. And so this was my, when I moved up to Wisconsin, it was my first on-air job. You know, I had to go up there and, you know, basically get some chops, you know, I was you know, you're just not good on the air when you first start. Some people have a gift and I had to work at it. So um, that's why I moved up there. And I will tell you, it was hard. You know, it was hard going from a bigger TV market to a smaller size market and um, covering, you know, like I was being sent out on Lake Winnebago to cover like ice races on boats doing ice races or something. You know, I was being covering all this like crazy nonsense stuff that I didn't care about sturgeon spearing, which, um, you know, uh, you go out and kill these ginormous, uh, prehistoric fish, you know, I'm doing all these stories that I, you know, I have to do to kind of get to where I want to go and, and do some real journalism. And then 10 months in, um, you know, I had only promised to stay there a year the, the news director said, I don't pay my reporters enough to, make them sign contracts. I just asked that you stay a year. And I was like, just counting off the days until that year was up. And this story broke and it was insane. Um, it was particularly insane when we learned that Teresa Hallbuck's one of her last stops that day that she had gone missing was at Stephen Avery's because he was a local celebrity. Um, he, you know, when I moved up there, I heard about Stephen Avery, the the guy exonerated of a wrongful rape conviction with DNA evidence, and he he was wrongfully convicted of that that case. I, I think we need to be clear about that. Um, so it was crazy, and it was just so unbelievable. But then I think we started to peel back the onion, as they say, and we found some things that made it look like maybe um, there was a reason he was kind of under scrutiny back then. And uh, it doesn't make, make him a uh, guilty of Teresa Hallbuck's murder, but there was certainly, you know, a lot of evidence found on his property that led police to say, we believe this is the guy who, who murdered Teresa. So um, it was really wild um, to cover it. Uh, I feel like wild maybe is too um, weak of a word. It was an interesting case, a really sad case, but I think it was also a very important case uh, because I think that, you know, there's the truth matters, whether Stephen Avery's wrongfully convicted or whether he's then later convicted of a murder, the truth matters. And that's all, you know, I ever tried to do in covering this case was figure out what happened. It, was there anything to uh, what he was saying? And who is this guy really? Because in the news, all you heard about was him being a victim of a, a very flawed system. And this is just a beast of a story. Just to give you an idea, Making a Murder is 20 episodes. Uh, you heard Sean say it's episodic. And his documentary, Convicting a Murder, is 10. That's 30 episodes together. And I will take heat from what I'm about to say. Um, I, I watched a lot of parts of Making a Murder, but um, I took some issue with the, uh, let's say, the production quality. And I got to say, and I'm not blowing smoke up as behind, but Sean Rex production, you know, just watching his episodes uh it, it really moved in terms of pacing and all that so that's something i'm always looking at uh, thanks yeah we're not going to show you paul eating lettuce for 15 seconds i promise yes please don't do that so you really you really see the uh filmmaking skills uh at work there but just to go through some of the basic facts because again this is a monster of a story uh back on october 31st 2005 Teresa hall back and i'll there's her photo right there. She is the murder victim and all this. We need to remember that she was a 25 year old freelance still photographer. She was taking pictures for auto trader magazine, uh, which seems weird because to me, auto trader magazine seems like something from 1947, <laughs> but that's a whole other story. But you, and, but you were uh, in Wisconsin in Northeast Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> that might be why that might be why yeah. no offense to Wisconsin. I love Wisconsin. Yeah. Uh, but at the time, Stephen Avery's 43. He gets arrested. Uh, what was really 
interesting about it. Just two years before that, he's released from prison. Uh, he's exonerated because of DNA evidence in a sexual assault case. Uh, and then you fast forward just a couple years later and he's now convicted. So it's just like back and forth, which is insane. And I thought what was interesting um, in watching your episode, Sean, is that Candace Owens said that uh, making a murder, uh, the directors just simply became too emotional, the producers and directors of the movie. Do you agree with that assessment? Yeah, I do. I think they I think they were all in. I think that they uh, made a big bet and uh, went through their life savings. This is my guess, you know, I'm, I'm, it's pure speculation, but they they made a commitment and uh, halfway through, I'm guessing they realized he's not quite as innocent as they originally thought, but they were all in. And, the, you know, there's a phone call on the day of Brendan's arrest of them calling and reassuring him, like, don't worry, we're not going to quit. We're seeing this through you know, uh, which is kind of a sign that they probably debated quitting <laughs> at that point. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, you know, I, I, I believe that they were too emotionally involved. I believe it was an advocacy piece and they, and they didn't then, but then they went out and did media and said, Oh, we were just flies on the wall. Um, they, they contradicted themselves. They said they were flies on the wall, but then they said they used narrative filmmaking techniques and had to develop characters and, and uh, then when once I saw the notes that they got from Netflix, I realized that the, the fix was in. They just they just you know there were notes telling them to use more ominous music behind the police and and uh, you know make the out of curiosity. How do you get your hands on those notes? Are you able to tell us? Discovery uh, because of the Colburn lawsuit. Okay. So we got the notes in that in that discovery. They also got our footage in that discovery. We had the we didn't get journalism protection, and uh, we had to give up a bunch of footage to the attorneys for Netflix. So they saw a lot of what we're going to air um, beforehand. And uh, how long did you? I think it was six years, but like, how long were you actually shooting um, before you got into the you know the edit process and all that? No, the whole time. You the were the whole time. I yeah. love it. Um, here you go uh, from Frankie Figs. We're going to bounce back and forth. I, I could talk to these two about this for probably nine straight hours, uh, but it's not going to happen this time. But I'll get Sean and Anjanette back. Um, Frankie Figs, uh, what's your take on Brendan, um, Anjanette? That is the nephew who's in prison. Uh, I've always felt he was manipulated by law enforcement. Uh, he was determined to be, you know, kind of low IQ. What's your thought on all that? Okay, so... I'm glad that question was asked. And just for maybe your viewers, if they're not familiar, Brendan Dassey was the 16 year old nephew of Stephen Avery. Um, you know, the Avery's lived on this 40 acre salvage yard property. They had these mobile homes there where they all lived, but they worked at the salvage yard and Brendan lived next door to Stephen in the mobile home next door with his mother, Barb and his three brothers who were older. And really he, um, developed a relationship where Steve with Stephen Avery, where his uncle gets out of prison, you know, he's probably like 14 or something when Stephen gets out and Stephen was kind of like a role model for Brendan. They spent a lot of time together. And so Brendan, uh, after Stephen's arrest about four months later, or so gives a statement to law enforcement in which he confesses, says that he had sex with Teresa. They, Stephen, he believed that Stephen had had sex with her. They, they killed her or at least Stephen did in that statement, there was some discrepancies, some differences. Um, and then Brendan is arrested and charged as an adult uh, with murder, sexual assault, um, mutilation of a corpse. And I, I will tell you when he was arrested, um, I had this just much different feeling about Brendan Dassey than I did about the arrest of Stephen Avery. Stephen Avery is a 43 year old man who was arrested and charged with this homicide. And they're saying his blood's in the car and bones are in his hat, you know, backyard by the garage and all that. Um, Brendan, I felt much differently about because I'm like, this is a child, you know, it's, he's not only 16, he's a child whose mother, the night he was arrested, I, I happened upon her and interviewed her. She said that, you know, he had a learning, he has learning disabilities, a lower IQ, um, you know, he's a kid, he's a kid. He like plays video games and stuff. So I see him differently, uh, than I see Steven. And when I think about, you know, the person who may have the more 
Stephen's story is interesting. Don't get me wrong and compelling. Brendan, you know, there was so much going on with Brendan. You know, the state wanted him to plead guilty, but then his family, you know, members of his family, including Pa, Alan Avery, uh, was telling him not to, to stick to his guns and not to do it. So I find him to be tr a tragic figure, um, not more tragic than Teresa Hallbuck, who was murdered. Uh, but I find it to be really sad and horrible. And I, I don't, you know, I, I go back and forth because I never, if he was my child, I, d I would never let my child go into an interview with cops alone. Um, you know, I guess maybe I just know too much, but yeah. I, you know, I don't know if he was manipulated or not. There are parts of that March 1st statement that I do not like. <laughs> I do not like. I, I, it made me kind of mad to watch it when I was watching it at trial and still annoys me when I see certain portions of this. Um, but it's a long statement. It's like almost four hours long. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, there's some dead air in there where he's just sitting in there alone. So I have a lot of mixed feelings about him. Um, but it just, it, you know, he was a child. He was 16 right. years old. And it, I, I, it kind of is just very upsetting from different angles as to how he ended up in prison. Yeah, I think the entire story at the end of the day is pretty upsetting all around. Um, what Sean said before is interesting and something to heed, and that is the fact that Netflix is big business. And you just heard him say uh, he saw the notes on making a murder, and none of that surprised me because I've been in those positions. Um, you guys all know, I, you know, I, Michael Moore. I used to work for Michael Moore, and I, you know, I that was deep inside the uh, world of documentary filmmaking as a news guy. Uh, there's so many ways things can be manipulated. And I'm not saying, uh, you know, uh, that making a murder w was manipulation per se. Uh, it was the way they, they told this story. Uh, what I found interesting, Sean, is you strike me very much as a guy who likes to tell the truth, the whole story, and completely apolitical. Was it a tough decision for you? Because the Daily Wire is, you know, right wing conservative. Most people know of Candace Owens. She's very polarizing. Was it a tough decision for you uh, to go ahead and work with them? Or was it a no brainer? And why? Well, we only had one other offer. We were we were really heavily blackballed in Hollywood. And uh, I'm not saying for a second that Netflix told people to not buy this. It's just mm -hmm. that, you know, it's it's a it's a carousel out in Hollywood, and the buyer for Hulu this month might be working for Netflix in two months, or may want to, and nobody wanted to be the one to take this to the air, um, and and be tied to it forever. So um, we had an offer from a woman's crime network, and that would have it was a good offer, but it would have you know this would have just not had very much international opportunity or, or opportunities in the future for people to, to watch it. And I can't really get into that now. Um, but with the Daily Wire, in retrospect, they're the perfect partner and because they're fearless and they don't care. And uh, when, when I had to go have the meeting, I always thought I was going to fly back out to L.A. to sell this. And I flew to Nashville I was in a completely different town that wasn't part of that ecosystem. And uh, I mean, I think Candace Owens, uh, I, I, I lean right. I'll admit that right now. Mm -hmm. And I, I've been a Daily Wire subscriber for years and I've been a Candace Owens fan for years. Um, don't agree with 100 percent of what she says. What, what, do you, what do you like about her? Just that she speaks her mind? She's direct. And she I, 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 I like that she made a conversion. Um, to be honest with you, you know, she uh, started out as a liberal and then just started feeling as if she was being used when there was a story, a big story about her and uh, kind of, you know, switched to the other side. That's always interesting to me. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm just always I'm, I'm, I'm usually 75 percent in agreement. I'm, I'm very liberal on certain things like criminal justice reform and I'm, I'm against the death penalty. I, I'm not in lockstep with any party, but I, I do lean right, you know, especially on regulation and, and uh, you know, high taxation, things like that. So uh, uh, it, it turns out now with all the hell that everybody involved takes from this, this militant group of truthers, and those are the people who cho chose to support Stephen 
Um, I, I think that we needed someone with Teflon skin who just couldn't care less what people are saying. So she's 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 the right fit, and that network is the right fit. So I'm I'm glad we landed there. And, and did Ben Shapiro have a hand in this? I mean, he owns it, right? Um, it's owned by Caleb Robinson and um, Jeremy Boring. Okay. Uh, the person who brought this in was Dallas Saunier. He uh, did Brawl and Cell Block 99, Dragged Across Concrete. He's done some really cool stuff. And he he's, he's kind of their in-house filmmaker. And he found it and thought, you know, this is a, a good cultural story that's not political. Because believe me, there are truthers who are Republicans and are Democrats. And there are guilters who are Republicans or Democrats. There's really not a political bent to this thing at all. Um, that's the other reason I was okay with Candace doing it. There's nothing, it's not like, uh, you know, nobody's blaming this on, uh, Bill Clinton or Joe Biden. Yeah. It doesn't but, come into it. And just to be clear, when you started this, when you began the filming process, was it in your mind already at that point for it to be a response to making? Yes, it was in that, it was in my mind at that point to be a response to, to making a murder. But when I started this, the daily wire didn't even exist. Yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, yeah. And Jeanette, to you, Tali, coming to us from the Holy Land, Israel. We've got viewers all around the world. She says, oh. I wonder why some cases have this charm that surrounds them, making them highly publicized and huge documentaries. And some other stories just get looked away. Uh, what makes a, a story a good one? Uh, can you talk, kind of talk about the confluence of events? There was, you know, kind of a... Uh, an anger towards law enforcement when this came out. It was during the holidays. I know that. But what, what do you think made this uh, episodic series, Making a Murder, so huge and now convicting a murder following it? Well, I, I think it's just the story at its core. Uh, you have somebody who got out of prison for something he didn't do and was exonerated and who, by all accounts, should have been ready to reap potentially millions of dollars from a, a lawsuit, a wrongful conviction lawsuit. We don't really, you know, we, the lawsuit was halted, you know, he settled after his arrest because the lawsuit was basically dead. I mean, he wasn't really going to get much money out of it. He was not a sympathetic character anymore. And, uh, you know, depositions were underway and you, you know, you, you get out of prison, you, you should have this new lease on life. And, uh, you know, you're riding high, you're, you're going to get this money more than likely uh, some amount of money. I'm sure he would have gotten. I don't know if it would have been 36 million. I think that was shooting for the stars, but he was going to probably get some money. And why? You know what? No, <laughs> it's not possible. I mean, I remember when I was first told about this, when I walked into the newsroom, you know, the more senior reporter in the b bureau had been sent out to go figure out what was going on with this missing woman. And you know, they say I walk back in and I was like, hey, what's up with the, you know, what's up with the story? And they said, you're never going to believe where she went that day. And I said, what do you mean? And they said she went to Stephen Avery's house. And I said, what? I mean, I, I literally remember saying what? Like this guy, this cannot be possible. And I think that's a big part of it. Like nobody wants to believe that such a thing could happen, that somebody could spend all that time in prison and then come out and, and potentially do something like this. So I think that was a big part of it. Plus Steven gave the media a lot of material. I mean, he would see something on the news he didn't like and he did, 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 did dial up the news stations. I mean, he called me once he, he's called several reporters from jail. I mean, granted jailhouse interviews, he liked to talk. So you have, you have all these like different things going on. Plus this really sympathetic vi victim, you know, a woman just, running out to do this part-time gig where she made some extra money. She's trying to get her business off the ground. Plus she was very well liked, you know, and the whole community comes out to search for her. I mean, it was just this monster of a story. And I think that it, I was always surprised back then that there wasn't more interest in it on a national level. I mean, there was a little bit, but not the, the interest you would think. And so I, I think that that was a big part of it. And then you throw Brendan in to the mix and, you know, the family, Mike Hallbuck, the younger brother of Teresa was always out there speaking for the family. I, I think there was just this kind of stuff that came together. And plus, you know, I, I do think like it did appear on Netflix during the holidays. I mean, I remember this quite clearly that 
It came out right before Christmas. And, you know, you work in the news business, you work holidays. I, I'm not sitting around watching this thing, but apparently everybody else was. And I, I just, I think that there may have been something to that. You know, the, there may have been something to that. The whole Black Lives Matter thing was taking off around that time. And then you have this story that kind of is just so engrossing and unbelievable. And it does, I can see how it would make people angry because I, I didn't watch this at first. And then I went back and watched it, I started watching it. And I was like, I was like, okay, I don't remember the spooky music in the courtroom when the cops took the stand. That was, uh, you know, I'm being sarcastic. But I, I, I think there was, you know, there was obviously a tone to that show mm -hmm. and I could tell in some of the edits and stuff like, you know, they, some of these edits were made to kind of make the cops look like idiots. And, you know, one of them, I remember just one of them looked, made it look like there was like Bob in his head or something like, just like, Ugh, you know, like, but it was clearly an edit and, you know, stuff like that. I, I just think there was, uh, there was something to it that really kind of it was just tone it was music um you know homespun kind of simple guy and the cops are out to get him mm -hmm. uh, you know it's just that whole thing i think that's part of it and it's just the fact that the story whole story is unbelievable yeah the whole story really i mean i always say that uh fact is definitely uh stranger than fiction and well, definitely there, in this case thing, too and sean i mean i'm sorry to interrupt but i <laughs> I mean, just this whole th fact this woman is going around taking pictures for a magazine, you know, this auto, mm -hmm. like you said, it's like a throwback. Yeah. You know, and she's just out there doing her job and she goes out for the day to do her job. And then. Yeah. And, and there, there's so many, for those who don't she's know the. It, yeah. You know, according to the police. Yeah. For those of you who don't know the kind of the detail, the intricacies of the detail, there was a key found. Um, and a vial of blood that apparently had a little pinhole in it. So everyone thought the police were setting up Stephen Avery. We could talk to Sean about that. But, Sean, I'm interested just in, in the kind of the micro, you know, in terms of how you produce the documentary and directed it, but also the macro. And just looking at the comments, you got a lot of people who are saying that Candace Owens is great. Daily Wire is great. Right here, Observation Station, love the Daily Wire. Then right next to that, you've got Lori who says Candace, Candace Owens is a problem. Bigger picture here, um, Sean, why do you think we become so tribal? I mean, politically, left, right, and I don't want this to be about politics, but also here, you've got truthers versus guilters. Why are we so divisive as a nation right now? And uh, are there any solutions? I have to. I have to use. I have to use politics as a as a, a parallel. I know By the way, if your answer is too good, I might suggest you run for president. So be careful. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I have to use politics as a parallel because fifteen or twenty years ago, in in service to their shareholders, the big news divisions took sides. They started taking sides, and they started having more and more commentary. And then it's it just literally affected their newsrooms to where, you know, last year when I watched, um, or this year when I watched Devin Archer's testimony about Hunter's laptop. I, I would watch the Fox story, say, okay, and then I'd watch the MSNBC story, and it's like something completely different happened. And these are the same algorithms that told Netflix that people wanted to binge 10 hours of crime. And I understand they've got to serve their, their stockholders and internal constituents. So, you know, straight up traditional journalism was sort of thrown out the window that created an opportunity for filmmakers to fill the gap. And that's what I was so excited about. Filmmakers used to be beggars. We used to do crowdfunding and write for grants to make documentaries. Now, I mean, uh, we've made millions of dollars on more than one occasion from documentaries. And um, the market has corrected itself. That's how it should be because this stuff's important. And ironically, making a murder was a big part of that. But how did we get here? It's much, much, much worse now that the algorithms are part of our daily life because of social media. And um, it says, you know, boy, if somebody watches a Candace Owens video, maybe they'll like to see an InfoWars video with Alex Jones and all of a sudden they're in fantasy land. So, um, or something, you know, with uh, 
uh, somebody watches a Rachel Maddow video and all of a sudden the algorithm's uh, suggesting they watch something on the Koch brothers and how they're really running the, or the Illuminati is running the world. You know, I, I, it's, it's, it's all AI driven. And how do we, uh, how do we, uh, how do we heal ourselves? Um, talk, you know, I'll give the daily wire credit and I'll give Charlie Kirk credit. They go into hostile um, campuses and say, let's talk. Let's uh, even Crowder, who I'm not a huge fan of Stephen Crowder does change my mind. And he sits and he talks with students because, you know, uh, also I think a lot of uh, indoctrination takes place in, in university. So, so how do we, how do we fix it? I mean, that's, it's to talk and understand other people's positions. Um, there's, there's a lot going on right now. And there's a lot changing. This story isn't political, but this isn't the first time that things got so polarized. Um, the, there was a documentary about the Boston Marathon bombing mm -hmm. where the Redditors got together and blamed somebody and they committed suicide. Um, the same thing happened with Don't F With Cats. You know, Redditors uh, started doing theories and blaming everybody under the sun. Um, it's not real journalism. Uh, they're citizen sleuths, but they're not held accountable. And if they were, they wouldn't be collectible, you know, if you want a big lawsuit against them. So they kind of have this immunity to do this stuff. So I don't know. I hope somebody figures out an answer soon. So I'm not going to be able to run for president. Uh, so the bottom line is algorithms are screwing up our world. We got to, uh, I don't know, yell at Mark Zuckerberg and those guys for uh, creating social media. But uh, Anjanette, to you, uh, again, from Lori here. Uh, we'll go kind of in and out of the uh, the details of the story, and uh, I'd love getting kind of the bigger picture stuff from Sean as well, and also from Anjanette. But uh, Lori says Stephen Avery is smart enough; he would have crushed that car. Of course, it was a salvage yard, so he could have done that. No physical evidence. Blah 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 blah. How do you respond to all these different people and all these different sorts of theories? Um, I don't know if you care to share. You know whether you think. Stephen Avery is guilty or not guilty. Obviously, he's uh, convicted along with his uh, nephew. But uh, what do you make of this? How do you respond to people like Lori who have different takes on what should be factual information? Um, well, first of all, I, I don't ever say whether I think, you know, he's guilty or not. Uh, you know, the jury sat there for six weeks. I, I sat there for six weeks and watched this trial unfold. Um you know, the jurors did what they did. They found him guilty. Uh, there was certainly enough evidence for a conviction. I mean, there certainly was when you put all of the evidence together um, and, you know, what was found and and where, uh, things of that nature. So, I mean, it, no one should be surprised that he was convicted um, because the evidence, there was a lot of evidence. I mean, his blood in the car, it, you know, uh, potentially rivet a rivet from her, you know, jeans, her Daisy Fuentes jeans and the thing, her bones and a, you know, burn pit, her belongings in a burn barrel. I mean, all at his house. Uh, as far as this whole thing about crushing the car, crushing a car, for, it's my understanding from the the research I did back then. Um, you know, I, I knew nothing about this because yeah, just throw the car in the crusher and crush it. But you have to apparently like take a lot of stuff out of it from what I understand, the gas tank, the engine block, all this stuff, you have to prep it. And so you don't just like throw a car into a crusher and crush it. And that stuff would have taken time um, is my understanding. So that could be potentially be an explanation. I mean, this is a business that's run there. This is not, you know, just a vacant lot. There's people down there from what I was told in the pit, you know, looking for car parts and people are down there doing whatever it is they do. So, I mean, you know, I could see how if he, if he indeed did it, as the jury said, he, he wouldn't have had time to, to get rid of that vehicle because why would you crush, why would you crush a green vehicle, a brand new vehicle or a brand new looking vehicle? It was like seven years old or six years old. Um, and he had talked to me about this actually, you know, I've talked, yeah. I talked to Steven on the phone one night and yeah. He talked about this. He said, I would have crushed it. If I had done this, I would have just crushed that car. Um, and I was like, wow. Like, <laughs> what, what, what do you make? I mean, just from a personal standpoint, in terms of talking to him on the phone, what was he like? You know, 
he I, he is somebody I could have talked to him all night. I mean, we talked for a while and then I had to get off the, you know, phone to do a hit on the 10 o'clock news. It was a Saturday night. Um, you know, he's he's a talker. You can talk to him. He said some weird stuff. I mean, he definitely said some weird stuff like where I was like, oh, my God. Um, you know, obviously they had a different life on the salvage yard and upbringing than than I had. But I always try to understand where somebody is coming from. Um, but he's got some, uh, interesting thoughts about stuff and, um, you know, he thought a lot about it. He thought a lot about, you know, I asked him like, what'd you do that day? And he doesn't, I mean, he doesn't really have an alibi for the time where the homicide was supposed to have taken place. There's just all this weird stuff. You know, it's like, he said, you know, he makes that call to the auto trader and he said he left work. He got lazy for the first time in a long time. You know, I got lazy. So I went home and made some phone calls and did this and waited for her to come and all this stuff. And, um, yeah, it's awfully coincidental, you know, that you just for the first time in a long time, take off work on a day when you have a woman coming to take a car and she ends up, her remains end up in your burn pit. Yeah. So, can, I, can I can I can I chime hop, in, on, in. The, on the crusher? Hundred percent. Um, Stephen crushed one car. Okay, they crush in in bulk in in batches of three or four, so they have to crush one. There was one that was prepped. He crushed it. The theory is the law enforcement theory is he his family was not in on this, so they would have heard the crushing. First of all, it makes an ungodly sound. We show it in the show. You can hear it in the show. But it takes hours of prep. You have to drain the oil. You have to drain the radiator. You have to remove the gas tank because it'll explode. You have to get the wheels and tires off. And he, what, he, what he probably wanted to do if he was guilty was sandwich it between two other cars. Uh, so he was waiting for them to leave on their weekend. He was coming home early because he said he had a prison visit, which he never really had. So he had his excuse set up to come back and crush it. But that plan was was kind of interfered with. So, you know, he just he just flat out, as far as law enforcement is conformed is concerned, he just flat out ran out of time. Mm. You can't just crush a car, Angie. That's right. You learn something new every day. I thought. Well, and, I, and, and I'm I sorry. Can I add something to that, Joel? Sure. <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. Um, you know, if you look at the layout of the property, you know, the the his trailer is like here, let's say, and then the crusher's down like way down there. So I, I you know, if he did it, I am still unclear as to when he would have moved that vehicle and hidden it in that spot. But um, you know, it's my understanding too that he that area of that and Sean, correct me if I'm wrong, because uh, obviously you had just provided information that I don't think I knew, but that area wasn't that all Stephen's stuff down there. Like it the, was, uh, it, it was kind of ours. It was kind of not part of the yard. It was a, it was a strip behind a pond, um, and there were some very, very old cars there. So it would have stuck out like a sore thumb, still being a, a glossy, green, pretty new Toyota, around some cars that looked like you know, early seventies, late sixties cars. Um, but it, it was as far away from his trailer as it could be. And it was pretty doggone close to the crusher without being in the main yard. It's, it was just kind of a little offshoot artery. Um, if you look at the map where it was, where it was placed and it, it, it's, if I were him, that's probably where I would have hidden it. Uh, the contrarian points of view keep flowing in. You got Tilo here from Boston. She tweeted at me. She said, you better not say anything bad about Candace Owens. I am an objective journalist. So I'm not saying anything bad about her. I will say this. She's brave and she puts herself definitely in harm's way by expressing the opinions that she does because this is a wild country. I don't need to tell you there's a lot of violence in this country, too. And she says some things that are very polarizing. So uh, she's got some, uh, you know, uh, some grit at least to be able to go out and, and speak that way. Um, but you see here, T Tilo says made my digs. I think we're talking well about uh, Candace, this comment here from observation station, Candace O speaks the truth. If you hate the truth, you hate her. And then you've got Jason truth. Interesting last name, loving this. Clearly Stephen Avery is innocent. 
uh, a second time, a truther here. Manitowoc County should never have been in his house. It was total conspiracy. Uh, Brendan Dassey, too, clearly innocent. So you see clearly uh, how polarized just our own community is about this story, let alone, uh, you know, the 19 million people who watched. Uh, and I did check that number it was 19 million, I think, in like the first 30 days that watched making a murder. And a lot of people uh, you heard Sean say is the most uh, convicting of murders, the most watched. Uh, I believe he said true crime. Shall have him correct that in a minute if I'm wrong about that. But um, Sean, back to you. You know, you're talking about the fact that you wanted to make this response piece. Um, you're obviously tapped into the zeitgeist. This was a big um, documentary what was kind of the seminal moment? Like, you know, were you sitting on your couch watching it? Was there a particular point in making a murder where you're like, all right, I'm not buying this anymore. I'm going to make the contrary contrarian point of view on this. Uh, when I still believed that I, I, at the end of episode 10, I, the whole time I was waiting for them to close the loop on the blood vial and they never did. And when I read in the New Yorker that they knew all along that there was nothing to it, yet they wasted an hour of my life setting that whole thing up when they knew there was nothing to it. I got angry. You know, not only they waste an hour of my life, they wasted 10 hours of my life. So, and they, and they brainwashed probably a hundred million people worldwide. Two thirds of the threats Colburn received were from, from outside the country. You know, the, one of the uh, allegedly dirty cops, you know, Norway, Sweden, Australia, you should hear these these recordings. So this yeah. this was a worldwide phenomenon. Sean, but, real quick, for because not everyone knows, just tell them what happened with that blood vial uh, and why did that, you know, the, you obviously said that was the turning point for you. Well, the blood vial, the, the hole was made by the phlebotomist taking his blood and putting it in the vial. And then the blood vial box was opened by the Innocence Project, and it was dated when it was opened. And they are the ones who broke the seal on it. And uh, that blood vial contained blood that had the preservative EDTA in it. And the nurse was ready to testify to that. And there was also lab results showing that there were no, there was no EDTA on any of the samples they found in the car where his finger would have bled uh, near the, the key and, and examples like that. So it couldn't possibly have come from that blood vial, 100% impossible, and they knew it, yet they dedicated an episode to it. And that just, just as a filmmaker, it confused me. I thought they blew it. And then when I read, read the truth, it was just like, this is so bad. Someone read, and, they're, and they're walking around with, you know, their chests pumped with pride, winning ed editing Emmys and Webbies and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I was just like, there's, this has got to be fixed or we're going to destroy our industry. They're, they helped our industry, but man, now we've got to set the story straight or we're not going to have any credibility. We're not going to be able to fill in this center, real whole truth news gap. Uh, that's really well put. And, and I think Anjanette will attest to what I'm about to say, which is, in news, you've got especially cable news, which I'd love to get Sean's take on because I just read a, a commentary uh, you just yesterday that my lo my lovely mother sent to me telling, you know, and it's basically about why people can't watch cable news anymore. And that's a place I used to work. And it was interesting to read it. And among uh, the things is how tribal to become and, you know, they, they don't really talk to sources anymore. It's just these strategists who actually don't know much about anything. Um, oh, but it, the presuppositions, the presuppositions, the things they assume you're going to agree with that they don't prove yeah. drives me nuts. I can't yeah. watch it. I haven't watched it in years. Mm. I'm I'm uh, I'm worse than you. But what I was going to say is I'm sure Anjanette's been in this position where a news director tells you to cover a story and it's not really a story. But you have to make it a story because you got to fill time. And at the end of the day, um, you know, Netflix, like I said earlier, they're an entertainment business and uh, they are going to dramatize whatever they can to get as many eyeballs on things as possible. So the important thing there, I think, is to use your own brain and not rely on other people. And, you know, again, I'm going to take I'm going to get heat, uh, hate mail for this, not heat mail, but hate mail. But to whether you like Candace Owen or, or don't, to her credit. You know, she's an individual. She makes her, her own decisions. So, Tilo, how about that for you? Uh, Jay says, guess I've been living under a rock because I don't know about any of this. You remind me of my beautiful mother. 
Uh, by the way, she was like, where are my flowers? I'm going to get my mom flowers. I had to get the wife flowers because I was in the doghouse yesterday. But um, my mom didn't know about Tiger King. Jay doesn't know about making a murder and convicting a murder. You can watch Convicting a Murder now on uh, the Daily Wire streaming service. Um, true crime fangirl, Anjanette, this is directed right at you. Does Anjanette truly believe Brendan's confession was not coerced? Please answer that, Anjanette. Okay, so there were there were first, first of all, we need to be clear. There were two statements. Um, but I, I do want to I will get to her question in just a moment. But I do want to say, Joel, you said, you know, news directors tell you to do a story and it might not be a story mm -hmm. and it's not interesting and you had, you gotta fill time. That is true. Um, but I wanna just be very clear. Uh, I have was never told, thank goodness, that I was never told by a news director, how to cover the Stephen Avery, mm. Teresa Hallbuck murder case. I was never told to do something a certain way or to only tell part of the, you know, this part or don't leave that out. You know, I was told to go out and cover this story. You know, I, that's all I was ever told to do. A lot of people say, Oh, you know, you guys made so much money off this. You made money off of this. And it's just all nonsense because Joel, you've worked in news, especially working in local news in a small market. You don't make any money. So um, I know, know that I, <laughs> I certainly did not get rich covering this case. I'll tell you yeah. that right now. I, yeah, I, you know, people have that misconception for sure. Yes, they do. And like that. Oh, you know that the news managers are sitting around saying, you know, go do this because, you know, it's do with the story this way. Cause then that's going to get the ratings. You know, I got stuff. I got, I got scoops. I got the documents. I got this, I got that. I put it on the news. That's what I did. Um, but I, there are two statements in which Brendan Dassey really, I guess if you want to think about it, there are three uh, in which he provides information about evidence at the crime scene. I think the first would have been on February 27th of 2006 they take him out of school he talks about reddish maybe it was that night actually and i'm sure I, i'm sure i'll get screamed out that i messed up the the interview time and everything by certain people on twitter but you know he said something about reddish black stuff he thought it was motor oil or something on the garage floor of stephen avery's um floor there are things in his march 1st statement that led to him being arrested that he later said were not true in a May statement from like less than, you know, a little more than two months later after, after his, the judge ruled his confession was coming in, it would not be suppressed. The jury would see it. Um, there was a second interview by police without his lawyer present, which was nuts. Um, but they were trying to get him to plead guilty, uh, and to turn state's evidence against his uncle. So, his lawyer had to go to some national guard thing that weekend and was like, yeah, you can go talk to him. I'll just have my investigator there. Well, you know, that was nuts too. Cause that guy, that's a whole nother story. Um, but they interviewed him alone and he changed his story on some of this stuff. He said, no, she wasn't stabbed in the bed. Why'd you tell us that? I don't know. Uh, you know, so the story changed that she then was tied up with rope or something and taken out to the garage and, uh, sadly stabbed and uh, shot out in the garage rather than in the bedroom. So there were two different statements made in this case. I don't know why he gave two different versions of how she was killed and where. Um, I mean, they were consistent in the means, obviously, but not, you know, in the method or whatever, the stabbing and the shooting. Um, but the location changed. And, and I don't know why he did that. He's the only person that can answer that question. I talked to him on the phone one night too. His mom, that was crazy too, had him call me and that was nuts. And he did, this was right after he gave that other statement to law enforcement, unbeknownst to me, mm -hmm. um, that second May statement in 2006. And he, I mean, like apparently he's like confessing again to the cops in this other statement, which he says is coerced. And then, Five days later, he's telling me he's at home watching video games and then went to help Steven clean up reddish black stuff on the garage floor. So yeah. I, I don't know. I, I don't know why. I can't say whether he was 
coerced. I mean, if you say coerced, do you mean he was cajoled into confessing or that he gave a completely false statement? I can't answer the question as to why he changed the location of the homicide, you know, from March 1st to May, whatever date that was, you know, mm. but he did tell me he was cleaning up reddish black stuff in the garage and standing by this big bonfire with his, with his uncle and putting stuff in it. So that was Can a consistency as well. Can yeah. I by the way, Sean, real right before you hop in there, real quick, Sean, I want to let you know that my wife, who is uh, the COE, the chief of everything on this show, and is uh, highly critical. She watched your trailer, and she's like, "We're watching this tonight. We are binging it. It looks awesome." So go ahead, Sean. Cool. Um, I was going to say, you know, what they showed in Making a Murderer was there are accepted practices that are very uncomfortable to watch. The superior knowledge theory we already know. We already know Brendan and the read technique. They're accepted practices in law enforcement. They're pretty gross. It's the same way you sell a timeshare, okay? It's like closing a deal. So that, that stuff is leading, that stuff is suggestive. Just tell me who shot her in the head. That's a leading question. But the, the, the big stuff that corroborated a lot of the evidence was not led. If you watch all of, all of it, They'll answer a short question and he'll just go on and on with information that they didn't expect. They thought he was a witness, not a suspect. So that's where people kind of get it wrong. I think it's horribly unfortunate that he's in prison um, and he's probably done enough time. A lot of people will get mad when I say that because they say he could have saved her life. Um, you know, it's pretty controversial. But I think if it weren't for Stephen Avery, he'd be playing video games to this day. I don't think he ever had it in his heart to go out and participate in a crime like this. But it's it's angering to watch those t techniques that police do use because they they they're tough to watch. Um, but th those aren't the techniques that got the information out of him. And the other thing, somebody said earlier, they should not, the Manitowoc should never have been in there and gotten that key. They didn't need that key to convict Stephen Avery. They really didn't. There was enough without it. So that's what that's the way I look at the key because we can't explain it. Yeah, and Sean, you know, I was going to ask you, and I'm going to ask you right now. Um, this 36 million dollar lawsuit, uh, Stephen Avery, who was a plaintiff in a 36 million dollar uh, case against Manitowoc, Manitowoc County, and uh, former county officials for his wrongful conviction, which happened prior to him being convicted for this, uh, and people say, well, look, why would anyone commit this kind of a heinous crime, knowing they're going to be coming into some substantial money. I mean, talking about coming a, you know, from a, uh, an auto salvage yard to becoming a potentially a multimillionaire. How do you reconcile that the whole money issue and following the money trail? Well, if you're, if you're a sick person and you can't control your personal impulses and um, are that narcissistic as he's alleged to be, then uh, it's cap you're capable of suspending your better judgment. Um, because uh, your girlfriend's locked up and you need something. Um, that's that's one way to look at it. Um, he would have probably received six, seven, eight million dollars in a settlement if had he won the suit. Um, that's that's about how things go around there. I talked to a couple legal experts. Um, the county was not on the line uh, for that money. Most likely, it would have been paid by insurance. Uh, but make make no mistake, we had. Uh, we had a private detective appraise the Avery's business and property, and they are multimillionaires. I know they wear dirty overalls and everything mm -hmm. like that, but they are that their complex up north is beautiful. They have a fish hatchery, they have brand new buildings, and they have zero debt. We actually checked, so wow. they're not as poor as people make them out to be. People were doing Go GoFundmes. I know a lot of people in the auto salvage business, and there's a lot of dirt under their nails. But they buy cars for fifteen hundred bucks, or five hundred bucks, or three hundred bucks, and squeeze eight grand out of them in parts, just with the computers. There's a there's a network nationwide online where you can. It's kind of like an eBay just for parts. Uh, the alternators alone, they can make, you know, the alternators and the transmissions. They they can make more than it costs to get the cars. So that is not a bad business. People assume that they're poor because they, 
they dress like crap, but they're not poor. <laughs> they're not poor. You honestly, you can never judge a uh, book by its cover. I live in Miami where uh, everyone drives a Lamborghini except for me, and uh, they're not all rich. So cuts both ways. Um, Tarn says, I like Anjanette as the interviewed instead of the interviewer. And lest anyone thinks we are not the future, it is Friday morning in Australia uh, where Peony Pink is watching us. Uh, this is totally off topic, but Meve Moen, otherwise known as Steve Cohen, uh, suggested this question. And uh, Sean, you've been uh, very open uh, about, you know, having autism or being on the autism spectrum. How is that your superpower? I find that fascinating and uh, very encouraging. Because I had no business making this movie, but I didn't know that <laughs> because I'm like SpongeBob, you know, and I just keep moving forward and don't have, I just put the blinders on and people are like, you can't be the one to make, tell this story. They said that when I wanted to get into TV, it'll never get on the air. You'll have to pay for your airtime. And, and we had shows on KCAL in LA and, and uh, channel four on and prime time in Miami and uh, WKYC in Cleveland and Fox in Chicago. Uh, those, those shows solved 10 murders tips from those shows solved 10 murders and put 13 killers away one nine Emmys. Everybody's been telling me I can't do this since we started. And I'm, I'm, I'm oblivious to how incompetent I am, I guess. That's why I consider autism my superpower because I, I just move forward anyway and just surround myself with talented people. And I, I don't go with groupthink either. I can't, yeah. I can't get into groupthink. I, I, I usually tend to walk the other direction. Well, people with autism oftentimes, you know, have special skills. You know, they're good with numbers or they're, you know, they're good with their memory. Uh, are, are you particularly adept at, I don't know, remembering information or looking at video and remembering shots? Uh, is there an aspect of autism that helps you in that way? Uh, th there's an aspect of autism that helps me with story tracking. It's tough to get a movie, a documentary to track. And I give, a, I give myself the harshest notes there are. Um, as far as story tracking, I'm pretty good at that. I'm also very, very good at numbers. And I had all these uh, compulsive behaviors as a kid. When I would go to, to my music lessons, seven miles from home, I would tap my left foot every time we were, there was a driveway on the left and my right foot every time there's a driveway on the right. And I knew the count of driveways for that five or six hour, or five or six mile drive. You know, so that's kind of like a brain workout when you're a kid. So it, it, it does, I, I'm, I'm very good at math and, uh, uh, yeah, I've got some other, some other, st I have perfect pitch. I can play any music by ear. I can play Bach by ear on a keyboard. Wow. So that, that's the kind of stuff you, you, you get when you have, you know, autism, but then, you know, I'm weird in social situations. So yeah. it's, it's <laughs> where I, I blurt too much or I'm like on truth serum all the time. Yeah. So that's, that, that's kind of a drawback. Uh, maybe that's what's wrong with the COE. She's a little too truthful with me, uh, the wife. Uh, Sean, just to pivot it here, um, you know, I was watching the doc and, uh, you know, Candace Owens, I thought, made an interesting point because she said that, uh, you know, making a murder, the directors, again, were too emotional. Uh, but then she had a soundbite that I know uh, had have been controversial. She said, did white people want their Michael Brown moment? Michael Brown, of course, was the 18-year-old who was shot and killed in Ferguson, Missouri. That's when there were those crazy riots in Ferguson, Missouri. And then she asked the question, was this case kind of the beginning of White Lives Matter? Um, obviously, you put it in your movie, but did you think, um, did it become controversial? And when you, you, know, when you heard that, did, did your antenna go up and say, let me think about this? Should this go on the edit floor? Should I put it in the movie? How did you decide to put that in the film? A sociologist told us that too. Mm -hmm. And um, so did Dan O'Donnell. He said this is a cultural zeitgeist moment. And the fact is, some people don't want to root for a black person. So he was, for some, the white Mike Brown. And, and let me just qualify this. I've been called and I, I was called by a program director in Miami in about my Crime Stopper show. And they said, how come all the victims are black? Mm -hmm. People want to see people who look like them. I was told by my foreign reps, can you get a white guy on the cover of a murder in the park? It's like, no, the subject's black. They're like, it's never going to sell. They're very blunt, you know, abroad. Um, so race, race is very much a thing, especially in marketing. It took forever. You know, it took forever for, for that to change. And uh, yeah, I think that played into it. I think, I think there really is something to that. That was about the most political thing she said, and I was okay with it. 
because other people said it and we didn't have to use their clips because she just she just blurted it straight out without us working our way up to it. Uh, and back to the just the magnitude of, uh, you know, this case. Anjanette actually was uh, I think you were featured in Rolling Stone. I mean, do you ever think, Anjanette, while you were, you know, at this, you know, local station that you would you personally would kind of garner the attention that you have from this case? No, absolutely not. I mean, I, I thought the case, you know, as I mentioned earlier, was so fascinating and such a, a, a crazy story that I thought I was surprised it wasn't getting more media attention at the time, more national media attention. I mean, it got a little bit, you know, it was featured in the New York Times or what have you. And I think Dateline might have done something on it. Um, but no, I never thought that. I mean, I never thought that. I, I mean, I knew they were making the documentary. I, I didn't know I was going to be in it. I I didn't know what was going to ever happen with them. I mean, I, I met them, Laura and Moira, and I, I think Laura's sister um, were up there for the trial and pre-trial. So, I mean, I met them. They were like driving around in some old beat up station wagon or something. Um, and so, you know, I, you know, it's kind of like, well, on your movie, your show, movie, whatever, I guess I thought it was going to be a movie back then or a documentary as were movies back then, I thought. Um, comes out, you know, I want to see it. You know, maybe I'll watch it. Maybe I won't. Um, so no, I never thought I would garner any attention. I mean, I certainly, when Rolling Stone called, it was ironic because I always, when I was younger, like a teenager, I wanted to work at Rolling Stone. And even in, when I got out of college, I always thought, oh, it'd be so cool to write for Rolling Stone and, um, you know, do that type of news. Um, you know, work in news, be able to write about music, things like that. I thought that would be really cool because I kind of got disenchanted with like news for a time. Um, so no, I never thought I would get that much attention. I was, I was actually quite shocked. Um, Sean Reck, one more kind of detail that threw me for a loop obviously is the cat. So, uh, episode two, I think it is of your, uh, convicting a murder and it's right behind his uh shoulders there you can see the poster it opens with a discussion of a 1982 incident in which Stephen avery is charged with animal cruelty for setting his family cat on fire making a murder kind of really depicts it as more of a mistake where he's said to have kind of flung the cat over the fire pit um but it turns out it's much worse um is that partly what prompted you i mean i'm an animal lover and that just kind of reminded me of, you know, the, the money question. Why would he do this if there was thirty five million, you know, thirty five million dollar lawsuit on the table? And you said, you know, maybe it's something going on in his mind where he can't control himself. Um, did the did the cat, you know, I mean, that's that's obviously a proclivity of a lot of serial killers to start with um, killing animals. Is that something that really stood out to you or not or not so much? It stood out more so that the filmmakers soft pedaled it so much and let him explain it mm -hmm. and act like he threw the cat over the burn barrel instead of throwing it in. And when the cat survived, recaught the cat, dunked flammable fluid on the cat and threw it back in to put it out of its misery. So it was benevolent Stephen who, for the second time, threw that cat into a burn barrel or into, uh, over a bonfire. So, yeah, it's a sign of, of an awfully evil mind. Uh, some claim he was just there and somebody else egged them on, but I don't see Stephen as not being the alpha male in any group. Everybody was afraid of him, including his older brothers. Yeah. Uh, we're going to wrap in just a few minutes. Mac 19, I've watched the first three episodes of Convicting a Murder so far. Murder, uh, you need to watch the uh, the rest of those episodes. Um, episode two uh, introduces Avery's brother, Earl Avery, who says that he recalls an incident of Stephen Avery abusing his dog. So not just a cat, but a dog. And that uh, it also uh, he mentions that Stephen Avery, while in prison, asked Earl, asked Earl, his brother, to have sexual contact with his own wife. And Jeanette, I mean, this is pretty demented behavior, if in fact true. Yeah, I, I didn't know about the dog thing. I mean, that was like, I mean, the cat's bad enough, but I didn't know about the dog until um, I saw that episode where Earl said that. 
Um, so yeah, that's horrifying. Uh, the cat thing, you know, he tried to say to me like on the phone, I remember, you know, yeah, I burned a cat, you know, la di da. I mean, I think he kind of, he says, yeah, I know I made some mistakes. I burned a cat, you know, <laughs> he's like said something like that to me. And I'm like, People don't do that. That is not just something you do. I mean, that is like a, a, a right there exhibit A of bad choices and impulse control. And whether he gave this other guy the cat or what have you, I mean, he was me fully admitted to me that he he did the cat thing. Uh, the dog thing was horrifying. The stuff with Earl, we knew about that um, the allegation that he had asked Earl to have sex with his wife because it was in his prison file and also I think in the divorce records um, that I had done stories on, uh, you know, his wife when he was in prison for the wrongful conviction and the, in the thing where he ran his cousin off the road um, at gunpoint, you know, there was a lot of information in those records. I mean, it was like hundreds of pages and I mean, that's really aberrant behavior. I mean, who, I, I, who asks you're in prison doing time partially for something you didn't do. And you're asking your teenage brother to have sex with your wife. Um, that is just not right. And, and the level of like really harassment that his wife um, was subjected to by him. I mean, I have the records somewhere in my house. I have like a tub of Avery documents. I mean, he, he was doing stuff like recording audio tapes and sending them to her. Um, you know, there's a police report that documents like the audio tape he sent to her from prison. I mean, it seems <clears throat> to me that he just, he wants to control the women in his life. And, and you know, you see that with Jody. Um, you see that with his ex-wife. So, he does have, I feel, a, an attitude toward women in which he views women as being his, in some respects, for the taking sexually. Mm -hmm. um, and so people can say, oh, you know, I'm wrong about that and this, that and the other. Um, it, it, the evidence is there for that. I mean, he was abusive to Jody. He, she called the cops on him one time. She claimed he had choked her around the throat. She came home from races drunk or something like that. Um, because he didn't want her drinking. I mean, he's just, he seems to have really bad impulses and, and feelings toward women. And I, I part of, I don't really know where that comes from. And I, I would like to know. And I say this because he always seemed really close to his mom, Dolores. You know, he'd spend hours on the phone, I think, with Ma, as he called her at the jail, um, talking to Ma on the phone. It seemed like he was really closer to her than he was his father. Yeah, that's got to run super deep, but uh, no matter which way you slice it, that is uh, mutilating and hurting and burning animals alive is uh, really aberrant behavior. Analytical Blarney AB says autism is a superpower coming from a special ed teacher. And then uh, look at this. You do learn new things every day. Moto 88 random related fact. John Travolta's brother, Joey, runs filmmaking camps for teens with autism, which is pretty wild. Um, Sean Reck. We've had Chris Hansen on the show. Meve Moen is a friend of his, as I know you are. Uh, what is your venture on your shirt there? Show everyone that logo, True Blue. What's that all about? Well, True Blue is a streaming service that uh, Chris formed. I'm his, I'm his partner. I'm the president of the company. We formed it together. Uh, we've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of true crime content. It's a very low-cost streamer. It's kind of like an all-crime Netflix it's under $5 a month. If you go to watch trublu.com uh, and check it out, uh, there are like almost 50 new predator investigations. We call it Takedown with Chris Hansen. They're much more raw. Chris gets angrier. There's foul language. We aren't limited by uh, the same rules that Dateline was um, with these episodes. So, um, we would encourage everybody to check out watch trublu.com and uh, and see what the network's all about because Chris Hansen is never going to quit catching predators despite the dangers. Did you see that the quote unquote black Chris Hansen was killed two days ago doing a sting? No, it's, I did not see. I didn't know there was yeah. a black Chris Hansen, but I just met Chris Hansen's son, Connor, who's an awesome guy. But tell us about black Chris Hansen. 
No, there was, he's just, he has a bunch of imitators uh, who, who do it for views. And he's been telling them for years, guys, I'm embedded with the police. There are a lot of guns pointed at these guys. You're, when you walk into a Walmart and say, he wanted to meet a 15 year old girl, that guy can shoot you. And that's kind of what happened. So, um, you know, we, we, there's another guy in Toledo, Ohio, who, you know, uh, I think dad's against predators or something. He's been shot twice and he, you know, um, I think, I believe had something to do with, a with someone committing suicide. So, um, it's best to work with law enforcement. If you do this, uh, it's not a monopoly. Chris is the OG, but it's not a monopoly, but boy, get together with law enforcement and, and keep them involved so that these things can be prosecuted and so that you're safe. Yeah. I would uh, suggest probably not doing what Chris, Chris Hansen does for a living, just doing it on your own. Probably not a great idea. Um, Great panel today. Love talking to both these uh, individuals and I could talk to them for about 11 more hours, but uh, time does not permit. Anjanette Levy, She's been on the show many times. She's a correspondent and host with the Law and Crime Network. She's covered some of the biggest cases, including the trial of Stephen Avery, uh, Brooke Schuyler Richardson, and most recently the trials of Kyle Rittenhouse and former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin. Um, and Jeanette, do you think this is the end of this story or is it just, uh, I don't know, is there just too much at stake where it's going to have to take more twists and turns? How do you think this all ends? You know, I, I don't see, um, I know Stephen Avery has a very high profile attorney now, Kathleen, Kathleen Zellner, who took on his case after she viewed making a murder after she watched it. And she's filed a lot of stuff, um, you know, a lot of motions, stuff like that, you know, seeking new trials, seeking evidentiary hearings. Uh, all of those have been denied at this point. You know, the, the appeals court kind of threw her a bone the last time something got turned down. They said, you know, we're not saying like you didn't, there might not be something here, but the, what you're giving us is just not it, you know, and I'm paraphrasing um, that, you know, maybe he does deserve a hearing at some point in time. Maybe they will get that hearing eventually, but I, I just know it, this thing's been through the ringer with the courts I don't see Stephen getting a hearing or a new trial unless something really consequential comes up. Um, Brendan, you know, he's at the end of the road legally, as far as I can see. He went through the federal system, uh, the writ of habeas corpus. It was granted, then it was, you know, it was granted, and then it was granted, and then it was denied. Um, and, you know, I, I feel like Brendan Dassey, at least, you know, I, I kind of agree with Sean that I, you know, I, I thought at the time the sentence he was given was really harsh. And I, I hate to say that because he was convicted of taking a woman's life and sexually assaulting her. Um, I hate to say that, but I mean, he was a 16 year old kid. You know, we all know teenagers are not, you know, especially guys. There's all this research that their we're prefrontal we're definitely cortex dumber. doesn't develop, you yeah. know, until they're like 25. Plus he's, you know, he's got the lower IQ and all this stuff. So I, I w would like to see something positive happen for him. I know he's in a medium security prison now instead of the maximum security prison. But I think that for anything positive to happen for him, he's probably going to have to, I don't know, do something, say something other than what he's been saying uh, that he confessed falsely and stuff like that. So um, I, I hope that those two sides can at some point come to some thing. And, you know, and part of me, hey, I, I, part of me is like, God, maybe I shouldn't be saying this because I am a reporter, but, you know, I like to speak about what I think is right and what's wrong. And, and, and you know, I don't know what he's done while he's been in prison. I don't know if he's been doing anything to better himself and educate himself. Um, you know, I would certainly hope so that he's been doing some things. I know, I think he got a GED. I think I read that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't know. Part of me is like, well, maybe I shouldn't say this unless I like actually sat down and talked to him <laughs> and really saw, looked into his eyes for myself. But I just always felt bad for him. I always felt like nobody was looking out for him. And, it, and I think that stinks. I think that everybody needs to have their family and their loved ones looking. Everybody needs somebody to look out for them. Mm -hmm. 
It's well, in the governor's hands. It's in the governor's hands. He's the only one who, who, if he has enough compassion and grace, he can he can grab a pen and let him have a partial life. Let him have a little bit of life left. And um, hopefully he hasn't been turned into a criminal in prison because sometimes they're like prison colleges yeah. and you learn nothing but bad in your, you know, survival routine in there. But uh, I, I, I catch a lot of hell from uh, the police and the prosecutor in this case for saying this, but, you know, I'm, I think the, the governor is the only one who can let him out. But Sean, do you think he's going to do that? Because his, what his criteria laid out for that on his website, Brendan does not meet the criteria. So yes, he could do it with his signature. Like he could grant a pardon or something or clemency or whatever it's called. But do you think that governor Evers on the way out the door would do that? You mean because he's not owning up to what he's done? No, I mean, do you think that governor Evers would do it? Would you think he would end up doing that? And still, I'm sorry to ask the question and take no, over your show. You're, 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 the, uh, you're the journalist. But I'm interested in what Sean thinks. Do you think Governor Evers, you know, I don't think he can run again. Do you think on his way out the door, he would do that? That he would, I, because I, he, he, Brendan does not meet the criteria for his guidelines for his pardon board or whatever. He's saying you have to be, have been out for a time and, you have to have done this and that. There's all this criteria that he lays out. Sure, I, I I understand, but I see it as something very very simple. If he's if he's not going to run again, picture the movie Gladiator, and picture the emperor with his thumb sideways, and he gets to decide if he's going to turn that thumb up or turn that thumb down. I'm t I'm just saying I hope he turns it up. Um. That's 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 the only way. I, I, I'm sorry to be so simple about it, um, Angela. And uh, you know, he doesn't meet the criteria that he laid out, but I, he still has the power to do it. So let's let's see what happens. I'm not, I'm not going to hold my breath, but um, let's see what happens. Without Stephen, he never would have gotten into that type of life at all. Uh, hopefully the governor uh, does the right thing. Uh, not everyone's going to agree if he makes that decision to release him, but uh, I tend to agree with both Sean and Anjanette. This guy's brain was not even fully developed. Us guys are a little dumber and take longer to develop. So uh, we'll see if the uh, the governor, um, you know, offers some clemency there. Uh, for those who do not know, you know him now, the man wearing the orange and blue true blue shirt that's a new true crime streaming service check that out also check out his new documentary convicting a murder sean Reck is a connoisseur uh of documentaries he made a murder in the park also uh directed white boy which is amazing fantastic check those out uh sean if you're looking for a story i can tell you all about ellen greenberg Young teacher in Philadelphia, the suburbs of Philadelphia, 27 years old. She's engaged to her fiance, 2011. Uh, she is found dead. She stabbed 20 times, 10 to the front, 10 to the back of her head, back of her neck. An independent autopsy showed that two of those wounds were post-mortem after she was dead. And the Philadelphia police ruled it a suicide. And her fiance's uncle was a very powerful judge and this goes all the way up the ladder so if you're looking for a story glad to put you in touch with the parents uh loved having you guys on what's next for you sean your final thoughts um we're making a movie about reactors youtube reactors right now something a little more fun we've also got another story about the nuns who were killed in 1980 in el salvador called uh, the killing of sister dorothy that will be available to sell to networks in about a month that's that's going to be like an Emmy worthy project. One of the best things we've ever touched by some young young directors named the Earhart Brothers. I just mm -hmm. produced it and helped them pay for it. Um, and uh, we're going to keep catching predators until Chris can't do it anymore. There you go, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Love you, America. Love you, Cleveland, Ohio. Where are you, Anjanette? Kansas City. No. Where are you? Bite your tongue. Oh my Sorry god. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, I'm the road. You. I 
I'm in Cincinnati. So, oh, Cincinnati. You know, I don't know why. So I'm sorry Bengals, about that. Chiefs, you know. Hey, Ohio then. Love you, Ohio. Yeah, love you. Sean's like up 71 from me about five <laughs> hours or so, so. We actually just did a story earlier this week about the quote unquote thousand missing kids in Ohio trying to get to the bottom of what's going on with that. Thousand Adam. missing kids in Cleveland. Yeah, it's in crazy. Cleveland. Some of it is reporting yeah. issues, but we dove uh, deep into that. Uh, with a detective from Akron. If you missed that show, uh, please check it out. Tomorrow we're back with Phil Waters and Scott Duffy. Great Scott. It's your true crime, Phil. Every Friday we're going to be here at 5 p.m. And then Monday, it's kind of a sad day, bittersweet. It is Dan Markell's birthday. He's no longer with us. Uh, he was murdered, and Charlie Adelson's getting ready to go on trial. We'll have that uh, story for you Monday, 7 p.m. Until then, love you, America. Sean and Anjanette stick around for 